it's just so good to see you all this evening. Uh, tonight we're, we're going to embark on a, on a new study. We're still in the series on Esther. How many of you have never read the book of Esther before? This is one of the most exciting books in the entire Bible. One of the most, I mean, I am, I, I, I've really, come, I've come to the conclusion that Esther is one of the most complicated, the most exciting books in the entire Bible. And Esther is a book that's so intricate. There's so much involved in the scroll of Esther that you, you can't read the book without reading the other books. Yeah. And that's called a type of study called intertextuality. Can you all say intertextuality? Intertextuality. For example, if you read the book of Esther, and I'm going to invite you all to turn to the book of Esther this evening. If you read Esther by itself, it sounds like you're, re you're reading a Disney narrative. And I'm going to ask um, Dr. Vicky, can you just read verse 1 of Esther chapter 1? Now it came to pass in the days of Osiris. This is Osiris which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty providence. It, 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 it almost reads like you're reading a Disney story at the surface level reading. It's like it's almost like those once upon a time there was a king that reigned over the entire world. Then as you read on, it talks about the queen that disobeyed the king, and, and, and they had her killed. And then comes up this, this, this um, woman, this girl named Esther. And Esther was an orphan being raised by her cousin, Mordecai. And then she was taken to the king's palace. The king felt that she received favor from the king, and the king married her. And she went, and it's basically, it basically reads like a rags to riches story. It sounds like a Cinderella story where here Cinderella is taken out of that whole, that situation and now she becomes the queen of the entire Persian Empire. Isn't that how most of us have read this book in the past? Mm -hmm. And then when you read the entire book of Esther, the, uh, all nine chapters, how many times do you see the word God mentioned in the, in the book? Zero. Absolutely zero times. It's probably the, uh, it's the only book in the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's the only book in the Bible where, we, where God's name is not mentioned. But yet God is moving throughout the book. And as you read this book, what I want you to do is, um, as we go through this book of Esther, I want you to inter intertwine your life into the story of Esther and your pain into Esther and allow the Spirit of God to bring deliverance to you and to bring and, and allow the Holy Spirit to bring you into your highest calling in God. Amen? How many of you long for God to reveal your identity to you? To reveal to you, you who He's called you to be? Amen? Amen? You know what? God wants to reveal your identity to you more than you're willing to receive it. Because He loves you so much. In Genesis, where God said, let us make man in our image, right? That's not, that's not just a one-time occurrence. That's, that's in the continuous present. That means your entire life, from conception till death, is you are being formed into the image of God. So all the trials that you go through, all the tests that you go through, through it all, you are being formed into God's image. Yesterday I was driving down, I was driving up LaSalle, just past, around Chapman College area, and there's a sign on the church, and uh, and the the sign on the front looks like a movie theater sign, and on the the sign read, "Life is a test," and you know what? Life is a test. I want you all to see life in that manner, because everything that comes in your path. Every relationship, everything that you go through, is a, 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 see everything as a test from heaven. Mm -hmm. The way you handle your relationships, um, uh, you know, how you handle difficult situations, how you handle it when you're selected to be a jury on a trial. I mean, how you handle every situation is a test. And I want you to invite divine providence. Allow Hashem, allow God to be part of every experience of your life. Because you have a choice. You can either evict God, no vacancies, or you can invite God in and allow God to be the Lord over your house. Amen. Our bodies are the tabernacle or the temple of the Holy Spirit. And tonight I invite you to allow God to be in control. Wherever God places you in your education, uh, sometimes God, if you're a student, 
you, you may go through a series of rejections. This college, uh, this this college denied. This college denied. This college denied. Then you get finally you get one college that says accepted. Mm-hmm. Accept that as divine providence that God is God is leading you on, in your path. Amen. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in control. Mm-hmm. I want God to be in control over yeah. every single circumstance in my life. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Even in your career choices. I went through a situation in December in the workplace where, where, where a door shut. And then all of a sudden, it suddenly occurs and two doors opened. Mm-hmm. And then a third door. Then the challenge was, Lord, which door do I step into? Mm-hmm. And sometimes the offers are more difficult than the doors closing. Mm-hmm. I go, Lord, which way do you want me to go? Mm-hmm. And the Spirit, of God, the Spirit of God led me. Mm-hmm. The Spirit of God led me into all truth. And, that's, mm-hmm. and I want you to trust God to that detail. And allow God to be part of every single detail of your life. Amen? The title for tonight is Living Beyond the End. Subtitled, Esther's Journey from Trauma to Resilience. And tonight what I'm going to attempt to do, and I pray by the help of the Holy Spirit that I'll articulate it properly, is I, I want to take this, I want to take the experiences of the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, and I want to take the Holocaust and over and then, uh, then use historical intertextuality and overlay it with the Book of Esther, and to bring meaning to the the Holocaust that the Jews experienced, with the six million Jews that were exterminated in the most horrifying, the most horrifying uh, uh, situation. Things I, that I cannot even begin to explain, I can't express. I mean, just the, the depths of the pain, I, I cannot even begin to express what the Jews have been through. And many peoples uh, of different cultures have experienced uh, g- genocides from time to time, attempted genocide from time to time. And and I, tonight, I, I want you to allow God to bring meaning into your pain. Because I'm telling what I'm going to try to teach you tonight is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever studied in my life. The mo- is one of the most painful things that I've, I've studied because it allows me to think back to the traumas that my wife and I have been through through different circumstances. And, and many of you have gone through trauma that you cannot even begin to articulate. I mean, how does a child articulate be- being sexually abused by a parent or a rel- relative? There's no way they can articulate s- such a hor- horrifying thing. But these are some of the experiences that many have gone through. But, but the Word of God... Will, will give us the the Holy Spirit will give us the grace and the ability to our to to to, to process that type of pain. Amen. I wish I could say everything in life is wonderful, but it's not. I mean, some people go through the most horrifying trials. Im- imagine parents losing their child through a kidnapping. You know, you you can't even begin to articulate the pain that the parents are going through, and wondering how their child is. And if their child is safe, how is, and is their child a, a victim of human trafficking? I mean, what what is taking place? I mean, this is a, this this is reality, and these are things we have to talk about. And what do the what do the aborted children in the womb experience in 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 in, in the horrifying abortions that are taking place? You can't say they are not human beings. And today we've come to a day where abortion is permitted. It, five minutes before uh, before delivery. I mean, just unbelievable atrocities. And tonight, I, my, I, uh, by the, whole, the the grace of God, we're going to teach. We're going to talk to you about handling these types of pain. And I call tonight's share or teaching "Living Beyond the End" because when you go through a trauma, you really feel like your life is over, don't you? You feel like it's all over. Or maybe you've gone through an accident where you become uh, you, you, you become paralyzed. Or you've gone through some horrifying pain where you can no longer move, and and you wonder how how do you overcome that type of difficulty? But the Word of God has answers for everything, and some of the answers will not be revealed to us. But we just have, you know, we are not God. You, you know, I I had the privilege of having dinner with a good friend a couple of weeks ago, and we we're talking, and his his his, his wife is. You know, very, very much involved with church and things, but, but he's still kind of on the, he's still kind of, what's the word? He's still kind of on the bench. He doesn't, he, he's not convinced that God exists. And you know what? And, and, he, and he goes, he goes, how can you prove to me that God exists? And I said, I, I can't prove to you that God exists. 
but God can reveal himself to you. Amen? And I'll never be, you know, I can never intellectually prove to you that God exists because God is beyond my intellect. But I know who God is and I know God will reveal himself to you. And God is faithful. Amen? Amen. So I'm not going to try and take God's job away. I'll let God do what he does best, reveal himself to, to his people. Amen? So we're going to live, we're going to learn about living beyond the end. And often the things that you think are your end are just your beginning. And just as Esther rebounded from her trauma because she was extremely re resilient, you can recover through any situation. Even with a doctor's report saying that you have cancer or whatever the si or, or, or your spouse telling you, I want a divorce. You know, you wonder, how can I rebound from those circumstances? But you know what? God, uh, God, I want you to allow God to be in control and allow God to do what he does best. Let him be God. You know, I, I still crack up. What, remember the old movie, Bruce Almighty, where he got to be play God for a day. I don't know about you, but I never want that role. Just let's allow God to be God. Amen? So let's turn to the book of Esther. And we're going we're gonna to read these verses together. Just a few verses. Uh, Esther chapter 2, verse 7. I'm going to ask Dr. Vicky, if, was, if you can, just at the... Very loudly, if you can. Uh, we don't have a microphone. Esther chapter 2, verse 7, please. <clears throat> and he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, the uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Beautiful. Thank you for that reading. See, when you read this at the surface level reading, the shot, the shot level, it reads like a Disney story. He brought up Hadassah. That is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So Mordecai was the cousin of Esther, and he, ra he raised up Esther. Then what does it say? She had neither father nor mother. What does that mean to you, that she had neither father nor mother? Exactly. She's an orphan, right? Uh, her, her, her parents passed away. But I want to take you beyond the Disney reading and take you into the rabbinic reading. And what took place here is, Esther was of the royal bloodline of King Saul. King Saul was the first king over Israel. And King Saul lost the throne because he disobeyed the commandments of God. The first commandment was to wipe out all the Amalekites. Guess what? He let King Agag and he kept the best livestock for the people. First failure. Because the anointing of the bloodline of, of King Saul was to wipe out the Amalekites. So he failed that one. That's one strike against him. Then another strike against him was more, uh, Samuel told him to wait for him before offering the sacrifice. Wait for Samuel and he will offer the sacrifice. Well, Saul was impatient because he feared the people. And he, instead of waiting for, Saul, for Samuel, he offered the sacrifice himself. He took initiative in an area that he should not have taken the initiative. And because of those two sins... He was, the, God took away royalty from him. And then thousands of years into the future, um, um, who comes on the scene? Esther or Mordecai. And, and it says about Esther, she had neither father nor mother. Well, Esther was of the royal bloodline of King Saul. Esther is called an orphan not just because she had no father and mother. She's called an orphan because she is no longer part of a royal bloodline. Because the royalty, the anointing of royalty was lost because of her ancestor, King Saul's disobedience. So, so she, it's almost like she, and then as you, as you read on, Saul's name is not even mentioned in the ancestry. The father's name is mentioned, Kish is men mentioned, but, and, and it mentions other names, but guess what? Saul's not mentioned. It's like Saul has been erased from history. And Esther's, what Esther is doing, in addition to saving the Jewish people from extermination, from genocide, she's also rewriting the name of her ancestor, King Saul, back into royalty. And she does that by repairing the damage, by performing a tikkun, a reparation for Saul's errors. Saul lost the throne because of his disobedience. Well, guess what? How did, how did Esther repair that damage? She was obedient to Mordecai. I would put more, this is my opinion, Sandy's opinion. It's my opinion 
that Mordecai was of, a, of, the, of the caliber of the prophet Samuel. Mordecai was a great prophet. He was, he was also known as the leading rabbi of Shushan. He was, he was one of the, the greatest leaders of the Jewish people in, in, during, the, during, during this period in history. But he was also a great man of God. He was a great prophet. Yeah. And Esther, as you read through this Megillah, through this scroll, towards the, you start seeing her being called, as, as she, in chapter 4 and on, and as she takes initiative, she's called Esther the Queen, or Queen Esther. And now she starts moving in royalty. And she starts moving in the anointing. And she is considered the seventh and final prophetess in the Hebrew Scriptures. The, number one, the first one being Sarah, and the seventh one being Esther. And Abigail, one of the wives of David, was also considered one of the seven prophetesses. And I believe Mary, Miriam was, was as well, the sister of, of Aaron and Moses. And so Esther, I mean, Esther was a, became a tremendous woman of God, a woman of tremendous caliber, a woman that was tremendously prophetic, but she did not start out in that manner. Amen? Amen. I mean, look at verse 7. It says that she had neither father nor mother. And I explained to you what that means in my, uh, um, based upon her ancestry. She was, she was fair and beautiful. Often, you know, when you read a Disney story, we love to hear about the maid being fair and beautiful, right? Cinderella being beautiful, uh, Snow White being beautiful. We, we love reading the, these stories. And, it, it, you know, if you're into Hallmark movies, you, you, you love the meeting of a guy meeting girl and, and all that stuff happening. But when you read the Word of God, it's much deeper than that. Fair and beautiful doesn't only mean physical and facial appearances. Mm -hmm. It often alludes to one's character. Mm -hmm. David was, was called ruddy, and he, he was called handsome. It, ref, it often refers to character traits. So, so Esther was of, of a good countenance. She, 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 was, she was pretty, but you would not consider her to be a, a Miss America. I mean, uh, she, she, she was pretty, but she wasn't like, she's not the way that we picture her to be. And if, then if you go down to verse, verse 8, she was, she, was, um, she was gathered together in Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai. Now we all think, again, this is the Disney reading, that she became part of a beauty contest. Imagine if every single lady in this room I don't know how many of you are single, but uh, every single woman in this room, sorry, Pastor Janet, every single woman in this room was called to the king's palace to enter a beauty pageant. And the winner of this beauty pageant w would be selected to become the king of the, mo the, of the mightiest king in the entire world. Ruler over 127 provinces, and guess what? The winning prizes, you, be you, you get to become the queen of Persia. How many of you would accept that offer? Raise your hand. <laughs> I only saw two hands. <laughs> only two? Not the third one, Lydia? Only, only, okay, three hands. All right. <laughs> That's not what took place. <laughs> Esther was kidnapped against her against her will. Mm. She, 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 she was kidnapped. Mm -hmm. she, Esther, being a woman that was fair. That that was that was um beautiful. She she, did, she she was kidnapped. She was traumatized. Mm -hmm. She was placed into the king's harem. Mm -hmm. She entered a beauty contest that she had no desire to be part of. Mm -hmm. Being a good Jewish uh, young woman, mm -hmm. she had she had no desire to become the bride of of probably one of the most wicked men in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was completely against her will. Can you imagine how traumatized she was? Wow. See, see, now we're going beyond the Disney reading, mm -hmm. and we're coming into the in, in, into the Torah reading, mm -hmm. and she is taken against her will. Mm -hmm. It's not her desire to be, I mean, it's not her desire to become the wife of of a pagan king. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she would would choose to marry a righteous a righteous young man that had the same character as her cousin Mordecai, mm -hmm. but that's not what God had in store for her. God had higher things for her. God was going to use her to orchestrate events in which she would be, would be used to be a deliverer of the Jewish people throughout 127 provinces. Can you imagine that? That was the calling that God had on her life. And not only that, she was also called to restore royalty to the bloodline of King Saul. 
I think I talked about that in detail last week. So you can go on Facebook uh, and get last week's teaching or on YouTube. Just search for Destin for Tori and get last week's teaching and the week before. So I'm not going to focus too much on what she lost. But tonight I want to focus on the trauma. <laughs> I want to focus on the pain. And, you know, look at what takes place here. Verse, um, verse um, 8, she's, put, she's placed in the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the women. Then verse 10, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she, she, she should not show it. So nobody knew that she, was, that she was Jewish because she was obedient to Mordecai. And then verse um, 11, Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did. See, everything's being, everything around Esther, Esther's not an active participant in anything that's taken place. She is completely passive at this stage in her development. And, and then verse 16, Esther was taken to the king. See, she didn't go of her own initiative. She was taken to the king. And then verse 17, the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. We're not going to focus on Vashti tonight, but we're, we're, we're going to focus on Esther. Now Esther, contrary to what you've been taught, Esther was average. She was, she wasn't objectively beautiful. She, I mean, she was she was good looking, but she wasn't she wasn't what, you know what I would call a, a you know a, a Miss Universe or a Miss fill in the blank. It was her qualities, her, her character traits that made her beautiful. Yeah. How many of you have met people that it, it, they may not look great w w on the outside the way you perceive beauty? And of course, beauty is in the, in the eyes of the beholder. Every one of us have a different perception of what beauty, of what physical beauty is. But doesn't the beautiful character stand out more uh, th yeah. than, than, than physical beauty? Yeah. That is what the king took notice of. It was her character, it, Torah values, biblical values, uh, character traits of, of loving kindness, of generosity, the qualities that, that, that come to you through, through the word of God. These were the character traits that, uh, that Mordecai used when he raised his cousin Esther. He, did, he, he raised her with Torah values. I mean, can you imagine being raised by a Mordecai, one of the most righteous men on, on the earth? I mean, just I mean, being raised in the ways of God. I mean, I, I imagine the way Mary and Joseph r raised Jesus. I, I, just I mean, I, imagine the godliest parents r raising their children, and how they're raised in the in the ways of God, and and called to, and 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 cause their children to live to a higher standard. Yeah. And so she's she's her it's her inner qualities. Her inner qualities are are, are the things that made her beautiful. She's not the usual heroine. You know, when I see Esther, I think about, I, I, you know, I, I can't help it. I think about the characters that I, I love watching growing up, whether it be Clark Kent to Superman or Diana Prince to Wonder Woman. You know, just, you know, just, just take your, your favorite comical characters. And Esther's not like that. When you see Esther, she's, she, she's, not, she's, not, she's, she's, not a, she's not one that you're going to pick to become the queen. She's initially passive. Even her personality, her demeanor is not. You wouldn't look at her and, and make no. She, you wouldn't look at her and say she's going to be the queen. And then on top of all that, she's got many things against her. The main thing is she's a product of her ancestry, like all of us are. Amen. 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 Some good things, some bad things. Well, guess what? That there were character flaws in, in Saul. Well, guess what? Esther had them too. Amen. There were character weaknesses in Rachel. Who's who's her, her great 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 grandmother? Who and guess what? She had those flaws as well. But guess what? She also had the strengths of of these different people in her ancestry. Yeah. Rachel's strength taken when Jacob and Rachel took initiative. King Saul's humility. When he when King Saul started out, he was extremely humble, mm -hmm. but later on he became prideful. Saul demonstrated a lack of, uh, lack of obedience. Well, guess what? Esther overcame that weakness and, and remained obedient to Mordecai. Even be before she was queen, I'm sure it was easy to remain obedient. But now she's queen over the entire empire, and, and she still remains submissive to Mordecai. 
And one thing that you'll, you'll, you'll see about Esther, I mean, I want you to pay very close attention to Esther chapter 2. If you're taking notes, verses 7 and 8, verses 8 through 11, verses 16 through 17. If you're actually watching on Facebook tonight, I invite you to write uh, to post those scriptures in the chat. See, Esther had slices of DNA from many different people in her bloodline, going all the way back to to Rachel and Jacob. And look at Esther in this chapter. She's not initiating anything. Everybody is doing things for her. First of all, she's raised by her cousin Mordecai. She's not raising herself. She was brought to the king's palace against her will. She did not fill out a form. To, to, she did not go to kingahasaris.com and enter and fill out a form to enter the beauty contest. This was completely against, against her will. And she was captured against her will. She was placed into the custody of Hegai, also against her will. Mordecai, her cousin, told her not to told her not to reveal her ancestry. She may have been puzzled by that. Why are you telling me not to reveal uh, uh, that I'm a Jewish woman? I'm proud to be a Jew. And then on top of that, Mordecai is walking day by day before the court of the women, and he's seen uh, on, he's checking on the welfare of Esther. I believe Mordecai was doing a lot more than that. I believe Mordecai knew prophetically that God was in this and God was going to use Esther for a very special purpose. So and, and so, so Mordecai's inquiring. He, he's he's always analyzing, and he's he's waiting to see what's going to become of her because Mordecai trusts in divine providence. He knows God's in control, and he's waiting to see what would happen to her. Amen. Amen. Sometimes I see the book of Esther like like a chessboard, and we don't understand what's happening. You know, we're at the uh, at the micro level. And we're just pieces on the board, whatever we may be, and moving from place to place. But God sees the entire big picture. And divine providence is in control. And guess what? God, Haman may arise, Hitler may arise, but God's in control and God has the victory. Amen? Amen. And God will always save his people. And then Esther, it, you know, Esther's taken the king Ahasuerus. But look at what, look at verse 17. Notice here, it, it, it says the king loved Esther. Often when you read the book of Esther, if it doesn't say King Ahasuerus, which is his name in Hebrew, if, if it just says the king, it's often an, it, it often alludes to God himself. Now look at verse 17 again. The king loved Esther. I want you to replace Esther's name with your name. If your name is Annie, say, and the king loved Annie. Above all the women. And guess what? She obtained favor and grace in God's sight. And he set the royal crown upon her head. God is placing royalty upon every one of you. Royalty is not just wearing a British crown. Royalty is... You come into a place where you're walking in the fullness of God's purpose for your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, because the crown represents authority. And whatever ministry God has given you, that is a place of authority. Let's say you're in a place where God has placed you and promoted you to a position in a company. And he's, you know, and he's, given, he's given you an elevated position. Yeah. And in that position... God has enabled you to, to influence other people. And God may have put you in that place, not just to prosper you and your family, but he's also called you, he may also be calling you to raise others up and to bring others into the full purpose. And maybe there's others that are in a place where they, they don't think they'll ever do anything great in life, but you, but you may be called to go to, to them and raise them up and, and give them hope and show them you can do a lot more than what you're doing right now. There's much greater potential in you and, and to raise them up into careers and to places of influence and that they may be used. Amen? Amen. If you're in politics, God may be, you're not just there to promote your career. God has placed you there so you can lift others up. Amen? Because because uh, one of the goals of royalty is that you raise others people up to the place that God has called them to be. Amen? Amen. You know, 
you know, what, whatever circumstance they are, I'll let you use your imagination, but God can use, use you to bring you to a place where you're going to raise others up. Yeah. You know, maybe you're a school teacher and one, one of your students is in a place where nobody in the child's family has ever gone to college, has never gone beyond a certain grade in school. And that child will have the same limitation that my parents couldn't do it, my grandparents couldn't do it, my aunts and uncles couldn't do it. Well, guess what? I'm not going to do it either. But God may place you in that place that you're going to tell that child you can do much better than, than, than your, your, your family has done. Because God is going, to use you, is going to use you and raise you to another standard. Do you see how you can apply that in your life? You can apply this in every area of your life. Because you, don't, don't focus on yourself. The way to come out of trauma or to come through trauma, because I don't believe the trauma ever completely leaves you, because that trauma will be used as fuel that, that, that's gonna use, that God will use so that you can make a difference in, in the lives of others. But when you, when you stop focusing on yourself, allow God to use that pain to bring others into their destiny. Amen? Amen. And we, we, you know, we just read it, I told you that Esther was initially passive. And everybody's doing everything for Esther. Esther's not initiating anything. That's how Esther started out. Now we're going to come from... So now we see, we've seen Esther's passivity being passive, right? Now I want you to see Esther's trauma in this reading. Often when a person has gone through trauma, they shut down. It, it, it's like parts of the brain just shut down. Parts of their heart shut down. They don't feel because they, 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 because our bodies, our minds will. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but just from what I understand, we have our human, our minds are so amazing that God has given us the ability to shut down in areas that we can't process at that moment. If a child's gone through some uh, calamity and they can't process that pain, well, guess what? They have the ability to re repress th those emotions, and later on, they have to be dealt with. You have to deal with it. You, you can't leave emotions su suppressed forever. But God has given us the ability to shut things down so we, so we can go on living, but later on you'll have to deal with it. And God is so merciful, He allows us to deal with these issues little by little by little. Amen? Mm -hmm. Some issues go back, probably go all the way back to our mother's wombs. But every one of us has different situations, different circumstances that we need to overcome. Amen? And now let's go to Esther chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Let's all read this together. I'm going to ask Dr. Vicki if you'd stand up, please, and, and lead us. Esther chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. When you have it, please say amen. Amen. Esther chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Ready, begin. Go gather together all of the Jews that are present in Shushan and bash before me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night nor day. I also and my maidens will go fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Thank you. Do you see? This is like a different woman, isn't it? She's nothing like Esther chapter 2. Now she has a ro r risen to the place of a heroine. Mm -hmm. yeah. she, she, and she's no longer taking instructions from Mordecai. She's telling Mordecai what to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at her initiative. This is where Esther arises to heroism. Guess what? Every one of you is going to have that moment where God's going to call you to arise. And God is going to call you to raise your outer voice, as I shared about last week and the week before. Not your inner voice. Now it's your outer voice. Amen? Amen. I mean, look, look, I mean, she says, gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. Neither eat nor drink three days. It takes a grace from God to, not, to neither eat or, or, or drink mm -hmm. completely for three days. And she and her handmaidens did the same thing. And then she said, I will go to the king, which is against the law. Because, and she says, if I perish, I perish. Meaning that she was ready to lay her life down to save her people. Mm -hmm. She rose up to the challenge, the, and, and she said, and, and she, I mean, and, I mean, from the, the rest of the Megillah, the rest of the scroll, she's a completely different woman. Now she's no longer, she's no longer a Hadassah. 
She's no longer Esther. Now she is Esther the queen. Next week, I believe I'm going to talk about the prophecy, how she prophesied the hanging of the Nazis in the Nuremberg trials. But that will be for most likely next week. So we, we see Esther rise to heroism. And one thing we learn about Esther is, and, and about you as well, but all of us, is if you lose anything, you can get it back. That means if God has given you something, it, maybe it's wealth, maybe it's an anointing, maybe it's a healing ministry, and, and somebody in your bloodline messed it up, well, guess what? God is so merciful that if you've lost it and if you've had it, you can get it back. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may have come from a bloodline of great men, men and women of God, great ministers, and then somebody, and then all of a sudden it just dissipated. Well, guess what? God can use you to bring it back. Because if you lost it, you can get it back. Esther's family had lost the royalty. Well, guess what? She got it back. And you can get back whatever you, you've lost. You can get it back. Amen? Do you all believe that? Yes. You can get it back. Yes. If you've Amen. had it, then it's part, of your, it's part of your DNA. And you can get back what has been lost. Yes. So once you have been assigned a certain, certain greatness, you can get it back. If the enemy has tried to rob you of your health, well, guess what? You can get it back. Amen. If God has plagued your family with sickness, you can get the health back. Amen? Amen. And prior to this chapter, we analyzed Esther by the way other people handle her. But now we see the role reversal between Esther and Mordecai, and now Esther is calling the shots. Now where does Esther's um, character come from? It goes all the way back to Jacob and Rachel. Now Rachel had, uh, had two sons with Jacob. The two sons were Joseph and Benjamin. Benjamin being the younger. And through the bloodline of Benjamin, we have King Saul. The first, we have Kish, the father of Saul. Then the, then the son of Kish being Saul, who became the first king of Israel. Then you go forward into the future, then we get Esther, we get Mordecai and Esther. They, they are all of the bloodline of Benjamin, going back to Rachel. Now, there's something about the bloodline of, of Jacob and Rachel. And what they do is take initiative. For example, do you all remember the, the, the event where Rachel could not bear children and Leah had child after son after son after son? Yeah. And then, Jake, then Rachel goes to Jacob and says, get, you know, get, you know get, give, give me children. Mm -hmm. And Jacob basically tells her, the problem is not with me, the problem is with you. Yeah. Seems like a kind of a Harsh thing to say, but there's a lot. There's a lot more going on here. But but Ra Jacob is really prophesying to his wife, and he loves his wife Rachel. Mm -hmm. So Rachel says, "Go into my concubine." And see, S and don't try to analyze this any deeper, because I don't want you to analyze what t took place by our Western culture of uh, the way we process things. Mm -hmm. This is an Eastern culture. Things things th th things are different, especially in royal families. Uh, um, if, you know, th things are just different. Uh, but I don't want to teach that tonight. That's for another night. So, S but see what Rachel did? She took responsibility, mm -hmm. and God honored that. And and then she she did have they did have children. Now, do you also remember the story in S in Genesis 32 verse 7? And Jacob sent angels to Esau because he wanted to find out if Esau was coming in peace or not. And the angels returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau. We came to your brother, to Esau. And he is also coming towards you with 400 men. Can you imagine how afraid Jacob must have been? How would you feel if, if you had a twin brother that you separated on bad terms with? And you're trying to reconcile with him, and Pastor Nelson hears that his twin brother is coming after him with 400 chieftains. Where do you get the 400 chieftains uh, Don't know the answer to that one. But the, 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 there were 400 men with him. And Jacob became very frightened and was distressed. You know, when, when people tell me you just need to have faith and get over it, I'll take them back to the scripture. If Jacob was afraid, then I think it's okay for me to be afraid as well. Amen? Because the Bible is, is also a journey of human experience. Amen? And we must learn how to deal with the fears. Sometimes uh, the, when we're overwhelmed with fear, that's also a trauma as well. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes we shut down because of that trauma. Yes. And now I want you to become a little bit, little bit more real about Jacob. Because mm-hmm. Isaac focused all of his attention on fixing Esau. Mm-hmm. That's why Esau looked like the favored son of Isaac. So in Isaac's mind is, I'm trying to help my son Isaac. I mean, I want to help my son Esau, and I want to make him a righteous man. And I want to make him worthy of the birthright. I want to make him worthy of it. So I'm going to spend, I'm going to focus all my attention on him. Mm-hmm. So in, in Isaac's mind, I want to fix my son. And I, I don't think any, I think every parent in this room would do the same thing. You, if you had two children, one was doing everything right. So you know what? If, every, if that child is self-disciplined and does everything right, you don't have to spend too much time trying to fix that child. But then you have another child that's so rebellious that you spend all your energy in that child. Now, I want you to put yourself into the eyes, into the shoes of the child that's doing everything right. The child that's doing everything right is going to think, Dad doesn't love me because Dad does not spend time with me. Mm-hmm. I believe Jacob grew up with that fatherless rapture that my dad does not love me as much as he loves my uh, loves Esau. Mm-hmm. See, the Bible identifies with every single circumstance of the human experience. And I don't want you to treat the Word of God like everybody in the Word of God is perfect, because guess what? None of them are perfect. Every one of them had issues. And and, and even David, as a great man of God he, he was, look at all the turmoil that took place with his siblings and all the stuff yeah. he, he, had, he had to go through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, parenting is not easy. It's probably one of the most difficult things in the world to do. But you know what? Allow, allow the Word of God to be, to be your blueprint to help you through. Amen? Amen? Just raise your child in the way he or she should go. And allow God to do the rest. Amen? And they may rebel for a period of time, but they, they, they will come back. We stand on trust in the promises of God. Amen? Amen. And look what Jacob did here. I mean, he was he was very he was very frightened. He was distressed. So he's going through a trauma. I mean, imagine this. Here's Jacob. At this time, he has his two wives, Leah and Rachel, the two concubines. He's got all his children. Uh, the only one that's not born yet is Benjamin. Benjamin is still in the womb of Rachel, I believe, at this period of time. No, actually, he is in the womb of Rachel at this time. And he's got all, all the servants and all the livestock and everything. Esau is coming with his four, 400 men. And Jacob is afraid. So what does he do? He prepares himself, he prepares his family for three possible outcomes. And there's a teaching here for all of us. Number one, he prepares by giving a gift. So he prepared gifts for Esau. Because he thought, if I give the gift, then he may... Then this horrible situation may turn into a peaceable, peaceful situation. Look at a situation in your life, in your family, or, where, or wherever. Sometimes fighting is not the, the way to resolve it. Sometimes you may have to resolve a conflict by bringing a gift. So, you know, and we must do our very best to live peaceably with one another. Mm-hmm. And I know there are situations where, where that remedy is not possible, mm-hmm. but at least lead with a peaceable solution. Amen? Mm-hmm. So prepare with a gift. And then he also prepared for war. So he was ready to fight as well. He's not practicing passive resistance here. He's prepared for war. Mm-hmm. And, what, and he, breaks his, he breaks the family into multiple camps. So if Esau attacks one camp, maybe the other camps will escape. Mm-hmm. And then the third strategy he used was with prayer. He, he prayed to God. He actually wrestled with God all night long. Some rabbis say that he wrestled with the archangel of Esau. I don't know the answer in, in, in that area, but what I do know, he prepared with prayer, he, pre- he was prepared for war, and he prepared with a gift. He prepared for a gift, so he sent the gift ahead of him. He prepared for war, so the remaining camps would survive. And he prepared with prayer. And that has been the journey of the Jewish people throughout history, through every single exile. The very first exile was the, the, Assyri- was the exile of the northern kingdom of Israel, taken into Assyrian exile, and, and, and really just spread out to the, the four corners of the world. 
but through, and, and then through every ex, then we have the four exiles that that that, Jan, that Daniel interpreted in Nebuchadnezzar's dream: the Babylonian exile, the Persian, uh, the Medes and Persians exile, the Greek exile, and the fourth exile, and the final exile is the Roman exile. The Jews are still living in the final exile today. The Roman exile will not end until Mashiach, until Messiah comes. When Jesus comes and ushers in the Messianic age, that is when the Roman exile will end for the Jewish people. And, the, the, and that has been the Jewish experience throughout history. You know, I cannot even begin to ex ex explain the atrocities that Jewish people have been through. I mean, they've, they've been expel expelled from Spain and Portugal. They've been expelled from England. Uh, they, 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 uh, the, the most horrifying situation was the was the um, the Holocaust. I mean, just horrible atrocities. But through them all, the Jewish people found a new identity and and and, and rose up and propelled. Actually, and they were promoted to to a higher level. Mm -hmm. They found a new identity through every single exile. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some peoples never recover from the exiles they go through. They never recover from from the trauma. But if you study the resilience of the Jewish people and you study the resilience of Esther, you learn the secrets to be to, to, to rebounding from horrifying uh, calamities, from trauma. Now, when you when we celebrate Purim, Purim is is often referenced as hidden resistance. Can you say hidden resistance? Hidden resistance. Hidden resistance. And when I was studying this, it reminded me of uh, of the movement that Mahatma Gandhi led, uh, uh, began, and that was known as passive resistance. Mm -hmm. So passive resistance is not the same thing as Esther's hidden resistance. Nonviolent resistance was marked by rejecting British-imposed taxes, boycotting British-manufactured products, and mass strikes led by Gandhi and the Indian National Congress. And we, saw, we see how God used Gandhi to liberate India from the rule of the most powerful empire at the time, the British Empire. And Gandhi's campaign, uh, campaigns, and I'm just going to read this to you, forged a new form of struggle against oppression that became the, a model for political and ethical struggles in other parts of the world, especially in India in the struggle for independence and the United States. In, in, in the civil rights campaigns led by Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, I love reading the speeches of Martin of, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I believe he's one of the greatest prophets America's ever had. I mean, absolutely used by God in the most phenomenal way, and God, His voice is still speaking to us in, in, in this day. Amen. 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 So. You see how powerful passive resistance is, and I believe Gandhi practiced this in South America, South Africa as well. Um, King used it in, in America, but Esther didn't use that type of resistance. She used what has really been the secret to the Jew's survival, and that is known as hidden resistance. Can you say it again? Hidden, hidden resistance. resistance. And the book, the Scroll of Esther is filled with examples of hidden resistance. When you read Esther, the Esther is a scroll that uses satire throughout the Megillah. Megillah is the Hebrew word for scroll. So the scroll uses satire throughout the book. Now what is the definition of satire? Well, I'll give it to you. It's the use of irony, sarcasm, and humor to, criti to criticize or show the ignorance of people. Yeah. This is very powerful. I'm going to read this to you one more time. The definition of a satire is the use of irony. Can you say it with me? Irony. irony. Sarcasm. 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 Humor. Humor. To criticize. To criticize. Or show the ignorance of people. I kind of use this stuff too much. So I have to be a little bit careful. And, and Mordecai used satire when he named the Persian adversaries of the Jewish people. So instead of referring to the, the adversaries, the Persian adversaries, by their Persian names, he gave them Hebrew names uh, or Hebrew labels. For example, the word Haman. Can you all say Haman? Haman. And when you, when you say Haman, you should say boo afterward. Boo. He did a little better than that. So boo. Haman boo. is similar 
to another Hebrew word, and it's spelled with different vowels, and, and it translates into English as noise. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So when you read about Haman, you're reading about noise. He's nothing but hot air. I, I said the, the equivalent of noise from the, from a, from a, from this Hebraic perspective mm-hmm. is the uh, I say American idiom is someone that's just full of hot air. Mm-hmm. You just pop the balloon and that air comes out, right? He's nothing but hot air. So that's how I want you to see the, your adversary, the devil. He's nothing but hot air. Amen. You can let him accuse, let him do all his nonsense, let him scream, but he's nothing but hot air. Now Ahasuerus, the king of the Persian people, look at the word. I want you to break it apart. Ahashverus in Hebrew. Ahashverus. Look at the look at the last part of his name, starting with the R. It sounds like the Hebrew word Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Kodesh, Nisan, or Adar, as we are in right now. It, Rosh means head. So in the name Ahasuerus, which in Greek is Ahasuerus, which is related to the word head, because the the Rosh in his name means head in Hebrew, and 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 what it means is. It, facil- it facilitates the story's own survival under Jewish nations. Head, God is the head. And God will make you the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy 28, 44. He shall be the head and thou shalt be the tail. Meaning that no matter what oppression the Jews go through, in whatever wherever they are in exile, God will make them the head and not the tail. Mm-hmm. Wherever the Jews have been placed, they have learned to prosper. Even under Nazi German rule, under, under, under Hitler, they, they prospered. Wherever they were, they learned, they, they prospered. And that's because of the Torah. Now the word Esther resembles the Hebrew word stir. Can you say stir? Stir. It means to hide or to conceal. I mean, she was God's greatest weapon in this entire Megillah. Because she was concealed. And, and it indicates she a divine hiding. And just as Mordecai instructed her, do not reveal your lineage. Guess what? God's name is not mentioned at all in the Megillah. God is hidden. As Esther's name, the word stir, is in reference to. God is completely absent from the text. And Esther's Jewish identity is, is hidden for, for, for much of the Megillah. And because Esther concealed her Jewish identity, she's able to obtain the favor of her husband, King Ahasuerus, and the favor of Haman. See, she, was, she used a brilliant strategy to get the favor of Haman and brought about his destruction. So she had both men wrapped around her finger. And the, the only two men she invited to the banquet were her husband and Haman. And what's even more brilliant, she stirred her husband to jealousy by saying, I'm, I'm going to throw a banquet for Haman. And Pat, Dr. Corral gave an awesome teaching on that on, on Wednesday evening. I encourage you to just go to, go to Dr. Michelle Corral's Facebook page and watch Wednesday night's uh, teaching. It was absolutely, it was probably the most amazing teachings on Esther I've ever heard in my life. It was absolutely brilliant. So, but I'm not going to focus on that relationship because you, that's from Wednesday night. I, I want to bring out different facets of the book of Esther. And because of Esther's brilliance and her obedience, and because she fasted and prayed and sought God, and she said, if I die, if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. The king spares the Jews at the end of the narrative. The Jews mark the 14th and 15th day of Adar, which is coming up in a few weeks, as one of the, a day of merrymaking and feasting in, com- in commemoration of their new fortune. Because more Esther became... It, Esther inherited all the wealth of Haman, and then she gave all that wealth to Mordecai, making Mordecai probably one of the, the, one, one of the, most, one of the richest men in the world. Yes. Now we, are, we have seen Esther's rise from trauma to resilience. Often when you're in trauma, you cannot do things for yourself. That's another interpretation of what took place earlier, because w- when you're in trauma, you can't even speak up for yourself. I want to give you personal examples, but I don't think it's appropriate for me to, me to share um, the, the, the personal examples. But what I have seen is 
when a person has gone through trauma and they face their accuser, they completely shut down and they can't speak. You look into their eyes, they're not even there because they're in trauma. And they shut down in, in the presence of their accusers. I've seen it happen, and, and it, it's, it's, probably, it's probably one of the most horrifying things to see. Be, and, and, the, and it's a natural um, re reaction because the person does not have, know how to process that pain. I want you to think about the, the 400 years of subjugation the Israelites experienced in Egypt. God had to raise up a man outside the confines of slavery and use a man that was free to bring deliverance to a people that were in subjugate in subject in so word subjugation. And that man was Moses. Moses was not raised in the confines of slavery. He was raised in Pharaoh's palace. Yeah. So often God will have to raise up somebody outside of the slave system to bring deliverance to those that are enslaved in the system. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now we're gonna go we're gonna live beyond the end. Because when you're in trauma, you, you, you can't see a brighter tomorrow. You, your life is over from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Your life is foggy. Your future is foggy. You, you, you can see no way of coming out of it. And just Esther lived beyond her end. You are going to live beyond your end as well. Mm -hmm. Esther is a book about living beyond the end. And often doing so by utilizing humor. You know, often we... You know, especially in the church, I don't see much humor. Mm -hmm. But humor is one of the greatest weapons against the enemy. Mm -hmm. And even in the most horrifying situations, sometimes making a joke will help you get out of it. Mm -hmm. D don't, d don't eliminate the power of humor. Because the book of Esther is filled with humor. Mm -hmm. Let me bring you to the trauma of the book of Esther. Because, because you know the end and the beginning, you, you, you're not really experiencing the Megillah. But I, I want you to read the book of Esther verse by verse and not thinking about what about the end. You get the, you, 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 you get the email saying that your people are going to be exterminated from the face of the earth. Let's say, for example, an edict goes out and all... Um, let's see here. Let's pick out a nationality. How many people here are, um, let's say, uh, uh, from, nation, uh, from origin are, are Mexican? If you'd raise your hand. All right. I thought the, the majority. Now let's say an edict goes out that all <coughs> all Mexicans are, go, are, are going to be put in concentration camps and they're going to be killed. Are you going to be afraid? I think so. Right? Or uh, I'm of Indian origin. Let's say all Indians are going to be put in the concent concentration camps. Of course we're going to be afraid, right? Mm -hmm. And so this trauma going on. But guess what? As Mordecai is writing the scroll, he's, he's, he's implementing so much humor throughout the book. And so this is... You can use humor as a way to deal with, with that pain. I've, you've probably never heard this before. But hum, humor is a tool that we can use against the enemy. And the Jews in the book of Esther eventually turned the tables completely around. And, and, and they called for the mass annihilation of the ones that were trying to kill them. Because the king passed an edict allowing the Jews to defend themselves. And prophecy is creative. You know, we think about prophecy as something that's telling the future. Prophecy is much more than that. Prophecy will, depending on the context, will tell you what's going to happen. Like there's a prophecy that went out that Cyrus would become king. Which I, I, I think, I believe I, I, that was th through Isaiah. But this prophecy is also teaching you, uh, prophecy is also used. God will use prophecy to bring you out of your pain. And it will, a prophecy will enable you to come out of your trauma and to put words to the trauma that you're going through. <coughs> prophecy is, re, is creative. For example, in Hebrews 4.12, the writer says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, 
and is, a, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I want you to apply prophecy to your trauma. And when, you, when you've been through trauma, you're like an overloaded computer, and you can't process the amount of information that, that, you, that you're trying to process. You don't have enough CPU. You don't have enough memory. You don't have enough disk space. Well, emotionally, you're being overwhelmed by emotion, and you can't process the pain and the trauma that you're going through. Well, guess what? The Word of God is powerful. It's sharper than a double-edged sword, and the Word of God will bring meaning to that pain and allow you to process the, 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 the trauma that you're going through. Yes. Amen? Amen? As such, the creation of a, of a new Jewish identity, one that overcomes Amalek's power and force. See, w when you go through this pain, you go through this trauma, God will give you three things. He'll give you the ability to process it, to process that pain. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you find your, your child strung out on drugs in the street. You know, whatever's taking place, that's not an easy, that, that, is, that is painful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you know, but the Word of God will give you the ability to, to, to process that pain mm -hmm. and then to, to survive, but you don't stay in survival. Mm -hmm. And then He gives you the ability to counter the trauma. Mm -hmm. Amen? That you, that you can come head on against it and you will overcome it. Amen. And that is what will take place in your lives during the season of Purim. That, so when you read the book of Esther, I want you to read it with intertextuality within the context of your personal trauma. And even when you study the Jewish Holocaust, Read it with in, in intertextuality with the book of Esther. Now I'm going to read this to you. I forget the source. But this is what it reads. Through outlandish plot twist. Can you say plot twist? Plot, plot twist. twist. Topsy-turvy character dynamics. Topsy-turvy Topsy character dynamics. And exaggerated, exaggerated. Appropriation, appropriation of enemy customs. Of enemy customs. Esther creates a comic counter world in which the contextual not heroes that is the diaspora Jews become the heroes who overturn the Persians they overturn Persian law and they survive mass extermination under Haman and the Persian king. See, it's almost like the book of Esther is almost like a comic. You know, last week I shared about Haman. And in chapter 6, the king could not, King Ahasuerus could not sleep. So he asked for the book of Chronicles, Chronicles to be read before him. Then he read about all the good that Mordecai had done and how he'd saved the kingdom and saved the king's life. And then Haman's in the court at the right time. I don't know what Haman was doing in the court in the middle of the night. But the king hears him and calls him in. Mm -hmm. And then the, the king Ahasuerus tells Haman, asks Haman, what should I do for the man the king wants to honor? Mm -hmm. And Haman's thinking, what, what man would the king want to honor more than me? Mm -hmm. I mean, can you see the comic in this? This is so comical. Mm -hmm. And then Haman says, well, since he's talking about me, well, king, you know, dress him in your robe. Mm -hmm. let, let him sit on your horse. <laughs> give him all this gold and all this stuff. And then Haman expecting to receive all that, the king says, "Do what you do exactly what you said unto Mordecai," mm -hmm. and he despised Mordecai. Mm -hmm. See, this is the type of comical behavior taking place in Megillah Esther. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to share with you about as I'm closing here. I want to talk to you about the theory of trauma. Trauma can leave survivors with feelings of lost control and vulnerabilities. So much so that they lose the eye of a person. They lose their self-identity. And Esther had lost her identity. I mean, being an orphan, being erased from history, and now captured against her will, and now becoming the wife of the most wicked man in the world. And so she had lost her identity. Well, but Mordecai helped her to get her identity back. And God will help you to get your identity back. Because if you had it, you can get it back. Amen? Amen. And if you've never had it, God will create it in you. 
And so Esther gained her identity back by realizing who she was as a Jewish woman and realize and seeing herself in a, as as a, as a, in the in the national Jewish context to see herself in the bigger picture of God's creation seeing herself as, as as royalty in God's tapestry of creation and when she's she gained that new identity she came out of that trauma so in your trauma allow God to show you who you really are in him and through every holocaust the Jews have gone through they emerged even more victorious than before they became a greater people than even before look at many of the, many of the Jews that came from uh, from eastern Europe to America one, one of them was a holocaust survivor I believe he lost both his parents uh, uh, on in the holocaust came to America as an orphan well guess what he founded uh, uh, the CVS pharmacies pharmacies became a man of tremendous wealth and employed countless thousands and his legacy lives on today i mean i mean some of them many Jews have been blessed with so much wealth and it becomes such a blessing in the earth you go to many hospitals and you see that many of the donors are, are, are tremendously wealthy uh, uh, Jewish families B- because it's it they emerged out of the most horrifying catastrophes and emerged with a new identity amen mm-hmm. because trauma erodes one understanding of the world trauma destroys a person Many people never recover from trauma, but it's through the Megillah of Esther, I believe are the keys to recovering from trauma. And when you go through trauma, one reason why you go into trauma and shut down is because you don't know how to articulate the trauma that you've been through. And what you need to learn how to do through the trauma is to learn how to formulate stories and, and because it's through the stories that, you, that you're going to process that pain. And Megillah Esther is a story that processes the pain of the journey of the Jewish people until the end of time. It's a book filled with humor. Well, guess what? Allow God to use humor in your life to bring you out of that catastrophe. Many survivors allude to the sensation in their own storytelling attempts. I want to read this to you. This is from Ellie Weisel. And she writes in the preface of night, convinced that this period in history, the Holocaust, would be judged one day, I knew that I must bear witness. I also knew that while I had many things to say, I did not have the words to say them. Painfully aware of my limitations, I watched helplessly as language became an obstacle. That's one of the keys of trauma is you don't know how to articulate what you've been through. It became clear that it would be necessary to invent a new language. But how was one to re- rehabilitate and transform words betrayed and perverted by the enemy? Hunger, thirst, fear, transport, selection, fire, mm-hmm. chimney. Mm-hmm. These words all have intrinsic meaning, but in those times, they meant something else. Writing in my mother tongue, at that point close to extinction. I would pause at every sentence and start over and over again. I would conjure up other verbs, other images, other silent cries. It still was not right, but what exactly was it? Mm-hmm. In short, there's no language, no words to articulate what the Jews have been through. Mm-hmm. And even uh, uh, others, uh, the, 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 the Armenian genocide, other genocides that have taken place in the world. The mass murders, the mass murdering, the shooting of Indians in India during the um, British occupation. These are things I can't begin to articulate. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the way blacks were treated in America. And, I mean, to use separate water fountains, separate uh, uh, t- bathrooms, to be sitting in the back of the bus. Mm-hmm. These are things I cannot begin to comprehend. Mm-hmm. How can you put a person, because of, because of the color of the skin or any, a, any discrimination, how can you place them <coughs> as, as, a, as a lower person? But you know what? But this is part of the human experience. And and how could Hitler be so powerful that he that he led a very intelligent people and and almost like through a witchcraft uh, uh, puts a thing in their mind? He convinced them all that the Jews were the root of their problem. The Jews were, 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 were the cause of the poverty in, in Germany. These are things I don't understand. But I can think of no other way for this to happen instead of some type of mind control that was taking place. 
and when the Jews were under in, in, in the Holocaust and they were in the prison camps and they would actually use humor to, to give them some laughter in the midst of the pain. And whenever they, they read about the book of Nicola Esther, they would replace the word Haman with the word Hitler because Haman was a Hitler. And, and, and even through this Holocaust, and I mean, look at the riches the Eastern European Jews have brought to us. Now the Christians are studying the Torah. I even see Hindus studying Torah. I see Muslims studying Torah because I believe the fruit of their sacrifice is that the Torah has come to the world and has also come to the non to the non Jewish population. Ninety percent of what I teach you, whether it's Hebrew scriptures or New Testament, I I I, I try to go to the rabbinic roots of what's being said. Amen. Everything that Jesus said, you'll find its roots in the Torah because Jesus was the most J J Jewish of them all. His disciples called him rabbi. Mm -hmm. Even the, the words like an eye for an eye and a two for a two. Everything he said was of rabbinic origin. And often there were, they were, they were idioms that were used in the Jewish culture of the first century. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that you come through the pain is allow God to give you the gift to articulate the pain that you're going through through storytelling. Because it's through storytelling <coughs> that you will disempower that trauma. Amen? Amen. Amen? One of my favorite people that I've ever studied in Torah is a, is a woman, uh, she's with the Lord now. Her, uh, her name is Rabitzin Esther Young Rice. And I, I've, I've read almost everything that she's, almost everything that, uh, that she's written. And, I, and I'm telling you, I mean, sh she is a Holocaust survivor, mm -hmm. both sides of the family. And one of the most br the most brilliant Torah I've ever read is, is from her material, mm -hmm. as she shares her experience and, and, and all that she all that she went through. I mean, just the, just the, and her, her her dad was her father was a chief rabbi in the city they were in, and her, and her town was a stopping place be, be, before many Jews went to the concentration camps, mm -hmm. and and how her family hid Jews in their home. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it just and and it just it just absolutely. I mean, it'll break your heart when you read some of these stories. But be, but through that pain, she brought the most beautiful Torah to America. Mm -hmm. Just the most beautiful Torah. And she uses a lot of humor too. When she she, uses, she does a lot. A, a lot of humor. Mm -hmm. There's beauty in humor. You know, in our culture, humor is often is not used in the proper manner. But the but the Torah humor is hilarious. It's and and it and it gives you a little smile in the midst of your pain. Mm -hmm. Amen. So did Corey Ten Boom. Oh yeah, she did too. She used humor a lot. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, so many beautiful examples. And she used to house Jews too. Mm -hmm. it's just the, amazing. What is the name of it? Corey Ten Boom. Oh, Corey Ten Boom. Yeah. yeah true. You know, when you go through trauma, some survivors of trauma experience disasso disassociation, mm -hmm. feelings of numbness, mm -hmm. detachment from the body disconnection between mental self states to such a degree that the trauma becomes becomes hidden from conscious mind. Mm -hmm. I was listening to this um, professor um, during the week, I think last Sunday actually, and, and, he, and he was sharing uh, about, uh, and he was speaking to a group of, of, of Jewish uh, folks that, um, that had grandparents that had survived, uh, that had come through the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and so some survivors of the Holocaust didn't ever want to see it repeated, and they, they would not even speak about it. They were completely silent about it because they couldn't process it. And I mean, how can you process w w what they experienced? And there was, I read, and, that's, and he was sharing another story of, about this elderly man that had fought in World War II, uh, also a Holocaust survivor. And they said they could take all the pictures of his life and put them in two categories because he had two types of smiles. Mm -hmm. One smile was a natural smile of, uh, of their grandfather or a family member smiling, and it was just a naturally happy smile. Mm -hmm. But and that was like one stack of pictures. But the other stack of pictures, they saw the smile. It was like a, it was like a smile of victory. Mm -hmm. And whenever he had that smile, nobody said anything to him because they knew that he was having a flashback from the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like that smile of victory 
when we had defeated Hitler wow. and defeated the Nazis. And because he, he had a flashback. I was, uh, and I, I had d dinner with a, with a gentleman last Friday, and he was sharing with, with, with me about his brother. And he had come back from World War II, but he, he had some, you know, he, he had some, uh, some fear, you know, some ingrained fears. And what happened, every time there was a jet that flew, flew overhead, he would jump under the table and duck and cover. And, and his siblings would laugh at him and make fun of him when he wasn't there. But you know what? They didn't understand the trauma that, that he had come through. Um, one of my neighbors, he was really like, like a grandfather to me growing up in Fullerton. Um, he could not watch a war movie because it brought back memories. I don't remember. I think he was in the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. But it would bring back such horrifying memories and he would go and he would ha have nightmares. Mm -hmm. So this is part of the human experience. Yeah. And, and, but, and it's amazing how God will use the trauma of our lives to, to impact other people. Amen? Mm -hmm. And every one of us has traumas. You know, one thing I can't get out of my mind is the trauma that unborn babies experience. Oh, yeah. They're human beings. They feel yes. pain. They feel yeah. they experience fear. Mm -hmm. yes. Some people have the ability to remember what happened in the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I have no memory like that, but, but I've, I've heard many people say they do have memories. Mm -hmm. and, and, but th th there are human beings mm -hmm. in the womb, mm -hmm. and they're being, <coughs> they're being torn apart from the inside. <coughs> It's just, I mean, it's absolutely horrifying. I'm being this graphic intentionally yeah. because we are experiencing a holocaust yeah. in America. Yes, yes. And this holocaust needs to come to an end. Yes. Amen. Yes. It needs to come to an end. Yes. I'm never political in this class, but on this issue, yes. it's not a matter of politics. This, this is about human beings. Amen. Yes. And the book of Esther addresses the inherent problems of a Jewish minority and how they were caught in a political system and how they were traumatized by the king's ridiculous edicts. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They came through victorious. And you're going to come through victorious ag again. Mm -hmm. And God told the Israelites, never forget what Amalek did to you on the way, how, how he attacked the weak ones from behind. In every generation is going to face an Amalek. And God's command is do not forget what Amalek did. Mm -hmm. the, the, and every generation faces Amalek. In the 20th century, the Amalek was Hitler. In, in this generation, we have Amalek as well. But we, we must fight Amalek, especially the Jewish people, <coughs> must fight Amalek in every single generation. Yes. Yes. Now, we're in the season of Purim, right? Yes. I'm going to share one last thing with you. Because... I've always noticed that during Purim, there are events that happen in, in the world that line up with Purim. Mm -hmm. Guess what? The Catholic Church has finally released documents of what happened in the Holocaust mm -hmm. and why the Pope took the stand that he did during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. this, this material has been in secret for so long, but, but now it's it, it, it was actually, I read it in the Jerusalem Post this week. Mm -hmm. and, and, that this, and it's all coming out in, in, during Purim. It was also in a previous Purim where, where, where Iran, uh, the, the regime in Iran was blasting out that we are going to we're going to destroy Israel. It happened during a Purim. Mm -hmm. So every Purim is a time where, where, where of, of, of just these accusations coming out because there's a Haman in every generation. There is a Hitler in every generation. And I encourage you, don't forget about the power of humor. I, Bob, my wife, Bob, and I would not have come out through our trauma without humor. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you the, the humor. It, it's not, it's just, it, it's, humor is a powerful tool against the enemy. Amen? Yes, amen. amen. I'm going to invite you all just to stand with me. Heavenly Father, I just ask you, Lord God, that you just that you pour your love and your healing anointing to all your people tonight, Father God. That everybody that's here in this room and everyone that's watching online, that Lord, that you just pour your healing love. Jesus, you are the healing balm of Gilead. And I just ask you to pour out healing right now, Lord God. There are those that are about to face a surgery in which they are so afraid. And Lord, I just ask you to bring peace, Lord God, and to bring healing, Lord God. I'm asking you, Lord God, to meet us in every bit of our pain, Lord God, and help us through the traumas of our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you, Lord.